And hi everyone, and great to have you here, and great to be here. Uh, my name is Louise Rabinder, and I'm director at Exponential Roadmap Initiative. And we will have a session today where we will be talking about professional services uh, specifically, which is fantastic because there is a huge possibility and opportunity for these companies to support in working towards net zero. Um, the professional services sector, just to uh, ensure we are on uh, the same page, we're talking about those that are supporting when it comes to engineering or consulting for, for media or for IT and those types of professional services in consultancy that we, that, that is. And they may not have the emissions in their own value chain, but instead they may have them in the possibilities that they have when working with their projects and when choosing customers, ensuring that projects and customers are aligned with the 1.5 degree ambition. So today we're also launching the professional services matrix. I thought there was an applause there, but there was just someone <laughs> dropping, but yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> um, we will hear practical examples from one of the companies that we have been working with, and we will have another representative from this, another organization that we've been partnering up with in this creation, and then we will have a panel discussion. But first, I would like for some scene setting and I want to invite Jane Eisenhart, Engagement and Acceleration Manager at Race to Zero to come up on stage, please. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and my new friend coming to join as well. <laughs> Thanks, Elise. So Jane Eisenhart, I am here on behalf of the Race to Zero, which for those who haven't met us yet, we are working for the world's largest coalition of non-state actors, working to half emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. And when I say non-state actors, we get to work in a really amazing ecosystem in the voluntary climate space that's working with subnationals from cities to regions, also working with universities, hospitals, financial institutions, and companies, the majority of which are SMEs small and medium-sized enterprises. So really exciting movement of about 14,000 members to date all around the world and with many incredible partners including Exponential Roadmap Initiative who really helped to drive this coalition forward. One of the reasons it's really special working in a coalition is as conveners, we really get to sit in a special place of bringing people together to dive into new issue areas and really work on those system unlocks in the net zero space. We get to pull in all of the experts, the practitioners, those on the ground, and really tackle new emerging issue areas, professional service providers being one of them. And it's been a really exciting piece of work for us here this year, working with many in the ecosystem, including ERI, on developing some new and emerging best practices in this new and innovative space. So what we've been doing as a coalition is working um, with Oxford Net Zero for the past 12 months or so, really looking into best practices and emerging themes and consolidating the latest research on service emissions and really trying to bring this topic to the forefront and looking at the power of influence, different stakeholders throughout the climate ecosystem who are really driving this forward and getting to meet all kinds of new organizations that are using things from law to creativity to consulting to really influence and shape this space moving forward. So it's been really exciting work and today we launched our initial findings of that working group alongside partners, including many here today, um, which is setting out that scene of what this world of influence can look like. And moving forward, we really wanna think about what we can do as next practical steps. I think with the race, we get caught up in a lot of high-level frameworks. And what's exciting about events like this is we're really taking that next step and looking at things like this new matrix, the professional service providers matrix, is an actionable tool of how we can implement this in our work lives. And with professional services, it's not just with those who are engaging directly with clients or with companies, but everyone has a role of influence in different ways in climate, from civil society, which is really asking for the demands we want to see um, to the consultants who are engaging one-to-one -one with clients and have that role, to academia and NGOs who really develop the frameworks that we want to implement. So everyone here can take this, move it forward in their work, and I'm excited to see how we mainstream it. 
Yeah, and there's so much going on with the professional services right now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And today we had our launch event this morning where it was so amazing to be in a room of lawyers, creators, advertisers, and the big consulting firms in New York as well, all talking about driving this issue forward in new and creative and really innovative ways. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Jane, and she deserves an applause here uh, for setting the scene and showing the importance. Yeah. And uh, it is fantastic because um, having worked with many different types of companies when uh, working in the supply chain, which was my previous role, but when you worked with professional services companies, it was a kind of a different story because they straight away went in to see how can we make an offer out of this. Um, uh, so it's a fantastic way of, of engaging these types of companies. But um, now I want to introduce just the rest of the panel. All of you can come up stage, please. We have Johan Falk, CEO of Exponential Roadmap Initiative, CEO and co-founder. Welcome. And we have also Sara Lindstrand, Director of Sustainability at AFRI, Hen Henrik Tegner, Executive Vice President and Head of Strategy and Sustainability at AFRI. Very welcome. And Andrew <laughs> Van Lis Arlebar, Chief Sustainability Strategy Officer at Futera. Um, so, first of all, we're of course very excited about this matrix. So I think uh, you won. If you could uh, just clarify, what is it? Yes. And we have some slides here, so, so. and we also have a clicker. You can have the clicker there. Yeah, that, okay. So, why? The first question is why we developed this. Uh, professional services matrix. Uh, so before I respond to that, I'd like to start uh, from an overall perspective. What does it take for a company to be aligned with the 1.5 ambition? And that's basically the framework that we implemented the last three, four years within Exponential Roadmap Initiative to all our member companies, which take a holistic approach. It's not just looking at scope one, two, three, so it's about reducing your own emissions, halving emissions by 2030 towards net zero. Also, your value chain emissions, upstream and downstream, the down curves. But it's also about providing and scaling up climate solutions and accelerate climate action in society. So as a company to be aligned with 1.5, you should have a strategy which span over all these four pillars. That's a starting point. Now, for a professional services company, if you look at the impact, this is one example. If you look at the first and second pillar, the impact is important. You have to take care of your backyard, of course. So if you look at the value chain, for example, it's normally business travel, it's commuting, it's IT purchased goods and services. It's also cash in the bank, by the way, where we have a practice, greening cash, it's about the office. Uh, but the major impact you do is related to the third pillar. So that's basically which customers you choose and their alignment with the 1.5 ambition and th the purpose and the mission of your project. So this is showing the idea of the impact and that is why we need to have the laser focus for professional services on the third pillar not ignoring scope one, two, three, but these are minor, minor compared to the third pillar. Then of course, you can also impact in terms of influencing society, the fourth pillar, uh, influence policies and lead your transformation of your business as well. Now, that is basically the background. So we need to really work together to put the focus on the third pillar. And that is the reason why we developed this uh, professional services matrix, uh, which is aligned uh, with the principles that Jane talked about today. We've also been part of developing that, as you can see on the right side. Uh, some guiding principles when we've done this uh, matrix is absolute simplicity, sharpness, uh, and transparency. Try to avoid overcomplicating, but a simple strategic tool for companies to be able to apply. 
So how does it work practically? Well, it's basically two axes which anyone who works in consultancy like this type of matrix is be aware of, of course. Uh, so the first grouping is your customer, which could be on the top line, a climate solutions provider, 1.5 aligned customer, non 1.5 aligned, doesn't have any targets, transition plans, or it could be a non 1.5 aligned high emitter. So that's basically the way of qualifying the customers according to certain principles. And then if you look at the purpose of the particular projects, it could be on the right side, accelerating climate solutions, which is of course a preferred approach from a 1.5 alignment perspective, but it could also be leading towards 1.5. Uh, could also be supporting business as usual. And that particular case is of course excellent if you're working with a climate solutions company, but if you're working with a non-aligned uh, customer, just supporting business as usual, that will of course accelerate global warming from a global perspective. And maybe the worst case is of course if you're supporting customers to accelerate fossil fuel and nature degradation, that's pretty obvious. So the idea is basically, as a company, start to map out your portfolio in terms of revenues, as an example here, um, as a sort of baseline. And then it can be used both to set targets on how you shift your portfolio to the right and upwards. Uh, it could also be used as a tool to qualify particular projects. Um, and it can be used um, uh, as a tool to drive your strategic direction of the company. So that's basically the idea. Thank so you. It's very visual then because what you want to do is you want to move up to the upper right corner there. Yeah, exactly. And we implemented the principles. They're available uh, on, on the internet. And we've done that together with our partners as we run it, have run it through multiple reviews. It is, of course, a first version so that we will take in feedback in order to uh, see how we can Im improve and, and uh, adapt the matrix over time. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Johan. Yeah. And uh, one company that has been working uh, with us uh, to create this ma matrix, apart from the Futera, but uh, it is AFRI. And you have also tested it. So, Sarah, you have a few slides as well, and it would be fantastic hearing about it because I haven't seen this. Uh, so, how have you gone about this, and what, uh, what were the results? Yeah, so thank you, and thank you so much for that introduction uh, on the role of professional services companies, but also then this new framework. We've been on a journey this year uh, to apply the principles and see how could we use it for AFRI? Is it applicable? Could we use it with the available data and so on? So very excited to share the results today. Um, about AFRI, uh, just to set the scene, we're a technical consultancy company and we serve our clients within energy, industry and infrastructure with engineering, design and advisory services. So we are over uh, 19,000 dedicated em uh, employees uh, operating in these different business sectors that you see here. We run annually over 80,000 projects, so it's not an easy task to go project by project and try to map out in this excellent uh, matrix that we've just seen. We have been dealing with sustainability for a long time. We adhere to the value chain principle and we know that we have the biggest pos possibility to contribute to sustainable development downstream with our client assignments. And we've set sustainability at the core of our strategy eight years back uh, to make sure that we're really aligning the, the way that we work but also what type of projects we run uh, in the most sustainable way and addressing then climate change through the projects that we have. So we also know that we want to find a way to measure and visualize how well we are positioning ourselves in these different technologies and also for clients that are 1.5 aligned. So this is really where the matrix uh, comes into play here. So we were introduced to the matrix late last year and we decided quite soon that we wanted to try it and run the pilot for AFRI's business. 
And this is re really where the interesting part starts. Uh, how do you apply it to an AFRI context with the available data that we have, but also with additional external resources? Johan, you already introduced the different uh, axes in this matrix, and just to then delve into the AFRI context. When we started to look at the customer base, uh, that is what was uh, the starting point for the pilot and the assessment, we have over 10,000 clients in our client base. So we knew that we needed to find a graspable amount of clients to run through this pilot. And we have a very beautiful exponential curve here showing them that uh, if we look at our top 100 clients, that actually accounts for 40% of our total net sales. We decided to start off there so we would have a manageable amount of also projects to, to run through. We apply these principles that are outlined in the paper that you just mentioned, which are then ambitious criteria for to be able to say that a client is 1.5 aligned or not. And we did this for all the 100 clients uh, in the project team. And then also looking at the project axis. Uh, you will find also here a very interesting uh, exponential shape, but this is actually showing then, if you look at each client cluster here in the matrix from the first part of the assessment, you will also find that we have some really big projects uh, accounting for a big proportion of that client cluster net sales, but then also a long tail of smaller projects. So what we did was that we performed a sampling, uh, so we caught all the biggest projects for this client cluster, and then we did sampling for the long tail of projects. And we applied then the data and the data set that we have internally when we normally follow up on our, our business. We have our own internal CRM, the categorization we have in the customer relationship management system where we classify all our projects in um, 125 subsectors, so not only the overall sectors, but then also breaking it down into smaller subsectors. So that is information we have, have at hand. We also have information about the EU taxonomy uh, for the specific project. We know what delivering business unit we have, and then also other contextual information such as execution country and more. So we combine that and then also with the financial data for the project and we run it through the, the sample base that we had. And what was really interesting was that when we started to look at the sub subsectors that we have in our CRM, it was really useful to be able to set a base criteria or a base scoring based on the four different criteria here in the matrix and say that we know that within this subsector it will be at least a two. But if we find evidence that it could be a project that is, uh, could be rated higher, we will set a three or a four for that specific project. So that was the basis, and just to mention then that we were really conservative in the way that we then did this pre-mapping against the four different uh, scales here against the subsectors and the EU taxonomy information. And then the results were weighted and aggregated to show the, then the high-level matrix. So where did this take us? And we're really excited to, to be able to see the results from this assessment. So just to highlight, these are preliminary results from the pilot and the top 100 clients. But this is definitely a new way for us to see and understand our portfolio. So it gives a lot of interesting insights. We can see that we have some presence in the gray areas of this matrix, but we have the strongest presence in those uh, green areas, which would then be for with projects and also clients that could be considered as 1.5 aligned. And also it's really interesting to see that there is a large proportion that is uh, of the clients that is in the cluster of being 1.5 aligned or even climate solutions providers, but there is a, a certain amount of clients still in the non-1.5 aligned. And I would say we know that the, there's a long way to go. It's really ambitious criteria. So many uh, of our customers or uh, companies are yet to embark on that journey to have this clear uh, climate transition plans and much more. And just to give some examples, so if you would look in the right-hand side of the matrix, this is where you would find the projects that we conduct with, that is for zero emissions vehicles, carbon capture and storage, batteries, offshore wind projects, pumped hydropower, solar, wind, hydropower, so much of these are the projects that you would find there. But then of course we also do many other types of projects within, for instance, real estate or the food sector or the telecom sector. And this is where we kind of like, in the way we have the subsector categorization, there is room for improvement to really understand would it actually be a 1.5 or, or not. 
And most importantly, it indicates us that there is room for improvement. We know that we have a direction to set uh, and we want to further explore then how we can embark on this journey to use this matrix moving forward. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna jump to my right slides here. Uh, we really see that it's an, a very intuitive, intuitive and strategic tool. Uh, it will support us in really understanding and digging into the, the portfolio we have as a company. And most importantly, given that we have a very broad and diverse type of company, it supports that. So many of the frameworks we've been looking at before would maybe be specifically for one certain sector, but this will actually host the broad range of different sectors and te technologies that we're working on. So that is really a unique selling point for this matrix and something that we find very appropriate for our type of business. However, like some of the key challenges has been, for instance, running through these top 100 clients, it, con it took considerable amount uh, of time to do that. It's not always easy to find these external resources to be able to, s to show and in fact say that the company is 1.5 aligned. So, this is a challenge and also if you want to be able to expand the set of clients that we're looking at, we would like to have some sort of external databases or more objective you know, ratings of the companies in this four scoring uh, methodology that we see here. So that was one of the challenges. Uh, but then also that, as I mentioned before, in the way that we normally follow up our business, we would find some of these subsectors where we tend to cluster projects in a, you know, many different types of projects in one of the same. So we see that there's a room for improvement also internally to take in the learnings from this pilot and see if we would find a better way to categorize internally our projects. Um, and what we really want to reach is to be able to do this on a more automated way and really be able to scale it to cover a larger amount of our net sales to be able to work strategically and with targets in relation to, to the results. Yes. That was all for me. Uh, super interesting, and thank you so much. And the, one of the focuses uh, with the, when creating this matrix is also um, having simplicity in mind. And, uh, but not only simplicity in the matrix, of course, it's very important with the simplicity when you're talking about it. And this is, is kind of easy to understand, at least what's, what you're aiming for, if not all the uh, nitty-gritty details. Um, but what would you, what do you think, um, how do you think your customers would uh, react um, if they would uh, look at such uh, an approach? Henrik, do maybe? you want to comment on that? Yeah, but um, I think that we need to consider uh, kind of what all our uh, stakeholders will, will think mm. about this approach, right? So customers is, of course, one of them. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, we're not going to say you are in the second mm. line or third line here in, in the matrix. Uh, but I, I think it is um, something that, you know, you also see how we think that it looks right now, right? So I think that many of the clients that we work with, they have an ambition to actually move upwards in this uh, matrix as well. So I think it could be a quite good discussion with them because, of course, if we work with someone who is now non-1.5 aligned, but we work on projects that are to the right in this matrix, over time they will for sure move upwards, right, and become 1.5 aligned. So uh -huh. I think it can be quite uh, interesting discussion and I'm sure someone will be <laughs> angry because they think that they are on the bottom, but uh, that's, that's not really, um, I, think, uh, I think, the point. Yeah, um, that's not at all what I was going for. More because the trend is that customers are, not customers, but companies in general are aligning, whether it's a customer or it's a supplier. We all kind of know that this is direction we would move towards. Um, I was thinking it would be quite encouraging. Yeah, but, I mean, because we have, we have put really, as Sara was saying, sustainability at the core of our strategy. We have done that for, for some years, and we say we really want to be the preferred partner in the sustainability transition. So therefore, I think it's quite natural that the way we position, we also really say that we want clients that are on, on, the, uh, on the top here. Mm. Uh, so, so I think it, it goes very nicely hand in hand with that story. Yeah. Uh, any other reflections, uh, if you want to give you? Yeah, but, but I think I have a lot of reflections on, yeah. this, uh, on this framework. <laughs> because the, yeah, but for, first of all, I think that the, what, what is important is that we have been looking for some time on a good way to measure, you know, how sustainable are we, really, if you put it like that, uh, given that we now have put it at the core of our strategy. And it's not such an easy 
uh, question to answer. Uh, for a while we thought that the taxonomy maybe could help us here, the EU taxonomy, but it's proven to be, uh, uh, I'm not allowed to say disaster, for <laughs> someone would be upset with me, but uh, I think it, it's not at all uh, achieving what we, we hoped it would achieve yet, at least. So, okay, this is another tool. I think that this tool is also then providing a lot more information than the one number that you would get from the taxonomy. Uh, and and I, so I think that it is, it's really a nice tool because uh, it helps us also talk then about what do we want to be as a company, okay? We want to accelerate the sustainability transition. What does that mean then? Is it, is it okay to have a few projects here and there in the bottom left, you know, okay, maybe it is okay under certain conditions or maybe it's not. And that's what we need to, we have not, you know, firmly decided more than that it's clear we want to be in the top right, but you know, it's, it, it's a very good tool to have those discussions. Uh, I, I also think that the way now Sara explained how we have been working with it, right? It needs to be a tool that is somehow pragmatic with still giving us the sufficient precision in the result. And I think this is key. So how, how can we find it with sufficient level of auditability, whatever, but still manageable? Because you mentioned we have uh, 80,000 projects every year. We have more than 10,000 clients. We cannot sit and go through everyone line by line. And you know, it's not going to work. Okay. Over time, maybe it will be automated in all our systems, but it is not that now. So. And I, here I think we have a, now a nice, Okay, first preliminary result, but anyway, we got here with a, with a pretty pragmatic approach. I think that was very good. I think it will be very helpful for us to, do, to discuss how do we want our client base and project base to develop going forward. I, I really think it's a fantastic and great presentation, and thank you for, really for showing this. Um, but now, if we let in Andrew from, uh, from Fatera into this, the discussion. Um, any reflections? And also, how have you been looking at this matrix for your organization? Yeah, thank you, and thank you, thank you for having us. Um, and I guess maybe I'll just, like, like as Futera, just to give a tiny bit of context there too. So besides being uh, your, your, one of your hosts here today, uh, we're uh, very much on the SME side of things here, and I think this is very relevant to this because you talk about simplicity so much. As a small business, that simplicity is really, really key if you want to adopt that. Um, and uh, we look, at, we call ourselves a change agency working on the solutions and stories that accelerate um, positive change, which was also an interesting challenge for us because when we're doing a lot of work around, say, communications, it's not necessarily as easy to put this in a particular box. But um, uh, I think what's really exciting for, for us around this is that it, it joins a, a quest that we've been on for a number of years right alongside you of how to, not only how can we apply some criteria for ourselves, just as you were saying, are, are we sustainable enough? Like this is what we do all day, every day. That's a very important question to address as an organization. But also how do we get others to follow that and bring that into their business models? Because we're not here to transform ourselves only, we're here to transform others. So, um, and you were saying there's a lot going on in this sphere. Today we are also re relaunching our, our, our client disclosure mechanism, which is really about getting any company to think about just the, essentially the first column here of the transfer, or the, the axis of client, like who are you working with and asking that question and making that public because we feel like that's the first step of understanding this. Um, and so that's why it's been so great to be kind of one of the first partners to work with this here. Um, I can maybe speak to some of the, the, the lessons like, like you of, of bringing this in-house. I think what's, what's interesting for us, and it was likewise for you, is that this was not coming on an, on an empty vessel. It's not like we don't ask ourselves this already. So the first challenge was to have it meet our existing governance principles. There were already questions we were asking ourselves around this and we had to sort of figure out, it wasn't just at a stage at the end of all of these other decisions, it was how does it integrate into what we do. But I think there's really three different functions that it's performed. One is it's really been a helpful lens on the work that we already do. We're just retrospectively, and almost in a, in a reporting format, which I guess is one of the, the ambitions here, of if you make this public, how do we look back at everything we've already done, and does it help us clarify them in a certain way? The next is really is a filter. So we had filters already, so we're not, we don't need to be asking ourselves 
are we working with an extremely high emitter? We already have some principles. We don't work with the, the oil and gas industry. So, so that was sort of not a necess necessary use of this. But after that, it helped us become, so we've turned down clients for years if we felt that they weren't just aligned with what we were doing. But sometimes it was about the client, sometimes it was about the project. So in some ways, maybe this helped us articulate even more clearly where the hitch is, you know? Um, and then also, I think what's great about it is it, it's a, as has been said already, is it's a, it's a tool for improvement. So, you know, there's maybe a little bit of pass fail in here, but beyond that, it's an opportunity to keep, it's a canvas for innovation and expansion. So I think it's helped us internally and externally. One, internally go, are we pushing this client hard enough? Um, uh, even it's helped us maybe redesign projects from the outset, which is, in theory, everything we do is there to deliver good. That's the premise of our business. But how carefully have we thought about metrics? How much of a threshold have we defined that would, again, squarely put it in one box versus another? Not to you know, inflate one circle, but to deliver more change. And so I think we've really appreciated that too as a, as a design and a strategic tool to go, how can we push things further? The other thing I'll add is it's interesting is that we work with a lot of foundations who, again, have delivering good at the absolute core of what they've done. But if they've been around for a long, long time, they may not actually have thought enough about their own goals because their, their mission is to deliver good in the world. So it's been interesting that, again, both on the client axis and on the project axis, we've really been able to push ourselves and the people we work with. All right. And yeah, it's, it, when you have it like this, it's so much easier to talk about as well when you're rejecting projects or talking about how you should form projects and so on. Uh, but uh, Johan, over to you. Um, first of all, any reflections? Or how has, this, has it been creating this matrix? But what I want to get to is, um, how can companies in the professional services industry um, use such a matrix to create business value? So pick and choose one of those questions. But in the end, we want the final one. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, so interesting to hear all your feedback and ideas. And it's been incredibly interesting and uh, rewarding to work together because it was like an initial idea, I'm not sure, maybe two years ago or something yeah, like yeah. that, that we started to sketch. So it's really about uh, co-creation, mm. which I think is incredibly important. But I, I think one key point is that it's just putting the focus on, just by having that visualization, whether you are a management consultancy company or you are an engineering company or an advertising company, if you want to be 1.5 aligned, yeah, sure, take care of your scope one, two, three, it's easy to measure. But this is really what it is about, you know, to start to take that discussion uh, in the C-suite. I worked a lot with strategies. I think it can be applied. Where do you like to grow your business? But to also take into consideration that we have, to, we have a starting point. So it's not just as easy as going you know, up to the right corner. How do we actually move in that direction? And, and how can we do that in a reasonable, good, and profitable way? But also, <clears throat> An example, how can you incentivize your project managers and salespeople to actually push the produce one step to the right? That's uh, super interesting as far as I see it. So I see a lot of value from that perspective. I like to comment on the simplification in the implementation because we realized that we didn't thought about that. Well, if you have 10,000 or 80,000 projects, well, it becomes complicated. But one thing we're thinking about is, of course, well, can we, can we find a way to, to connect it, to, to create a tool where we connect, can connect it directly to the CRM system to be able to make an automated analysis or applying AI that you can basically, we could actually sketch this type of analysis. That's absolutely possible. Maybe we should do that as next step. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, you, you came into this internal alignment, but also, uh, uh, AFRI or uh, Futera, how, how can you go about getting internal alignment to ensure that you move to the uh, top right there? But I, I, I think we have this stated ambition to, you know, to accelerate sustainability transition and 
making future and those nice words. So I think that in, in and we're super aligned around those statements, okay? Then we have not really had a good way to explain or, or describe how is this then happening. So we have, uh, you know, certain sector directives, like you mentioned, you know, there are certain sectors we don't work with and there are certain sectors, there are certain projects we will not do, right? So we have those, you know, exclusion criteria. But what I like much, much more with this than the exclusion criteria is that, okay, this is, okay, this is the picture, this is the way it looks, right? And, um, you know, if there's a small dots in the, the bottom left, maybe it's not so bad, you know, I don't know, but uh, at least we can now have the discussion. Uh, and it's much, much easier now to, uh, I think, to, to take that and to really conclude what is it that we want to achieve as a business from top management and also have the discussion in, in uh, uh, different levels of, uh, of the company, for sure. So I think it's a, it's a great tool for, how should I say, more facilitating the, uh, uh, the discussions and the alignment and then, then come to a final conclusion. Yeah, it's a great recommendation, Andrew. I would echo that. I think, again, we don't have the challenge of getting people to think about this at all. It's yeah. what we do all day long. But, and and it's, it's questions we've been asking ourselves forever, but I think what's What's great is, again, it's an opportunity to really think about clear thresholds where you can articulate a clearer conversation about where is it you want to be. And I think particularly for us, we've always thought it's not just about what the company is, it's about the level of ambition that we're encountering there because, you know, it would be great to only work with companies that are already leaders, but sometimes that's not where the greatest amount of work needs to be done. And I think it helps us again, get to, you might be in, at the point where you're not necessarily working with someone else, and it just gives you a clearer read on where do we think, what do we think is enough, a commitment from the leadership uh, of our clients to say like, well, if this is where you're headed, then that's where we feel comfortable. And you can sort of, you know, perhaps more visually map it out than before and say, are we all trying to get here? until the CEO changes, um, uh, or whatever else happens. But at least it helps you chart a bit of a, a bit of a ambition roadmap from the outset. So if, any, if other companies were to use this tool, what would you say to encourage, or what would you recommend if they were going to apply this? I mean, Andrew, because I'm really again. I, I would say, to, to your point, it's, it's either an administrative burden from a lot of projects, it's a little bit of a, a new framework for people. Sometimes you have to, they're not necessarily easy to decide, is this leading, is this accelerating? I think you know, we'll all get better at that over time. I would say probably the first thing to do is go, how are you going to use it first? Is it going to be just a stock take of how are we doing and then you can use it strategically from there? Is it already a bit of a guidance tool at, at the outset? Because I think trying to do too, too much of that from the beginning will mean that you're not exactly sure how you're using it. It'll be a bit more of a confused message. And I, I really like the approach of using it for a subset, you know, a, a representative subset of projects to, to, um, to start with. The other thing is, and, and we know this from working with this industry over time, and, and you know, we're talking about the, how big these industries are in context. I think the interesting thing about this industry is, you know, it's worth so much in terms of revenue, but it's worth so much more in terms of influence. Um, so, if nothing else, it's just getting people to understand where they are at all. I feel like just as a, just a landmark exercise of positioning yourself and getting a clearer read on where you are before you really elaborate on that seems like a fundamental part of what we feel the challenge is in the professional services industry, which is this is usually a missing visibility. They'll, they'll tell you exactly the footprint of their employee commute, but that's, as we know, not really where the important changes are. Sarah? Yeah, and I, I just want to, I fully agree, but then I would also like to say, like, moving forward, I'm really, once we reach increased coverage and automate the way to map out our projects, I'm really looking forward to also engage internally in the business, because we have so many leaders internally who really want to start measuring, start being able to categorize. If we could have this type of support in the CRM system, even if it's not mandatory for everyone to use the scoring for the project or the client, I would really love to have that you know, potential or that possibility for the leaders internally so they can start driving their business and start mapping out. And we can see, you know, where do we really have the hotspots if we drill down throughout the business lines? Where do we need to push for more efforts 
to move in the, the right direction. So I, th I really see us also internally using this to, to be able to convey in a very intuitive, intuitive way, how do we need to understand our business to drive impact? But then also, like if we look at your part of the business, this is how we could uh, understand it. Uh, Johan, um, would you see any challenges um, for applying this matrix? And also, obviously, we think there are opportunities because mm -hmm. <laughs> we have this matrix. We want to, it to move forward. But uh, what can block it? Well, one, one challenge we talked about is the automation. If we can find a way to, to, to automate analysis would be brilliant. There is also another challenge in terms of the qualification when we looked at that. How you, the devil is in the detail on how precisely you do that. For example, qualification of a 1.5 line company, where of course we applied a combination of principles from Race to Zero and all the other frameworks, including our own that we know, but uh, still, um, still that is a challenge. We have to tune that over time to ensure it's sufficiently sharp, uh, but not too, too complicated. Mm. So, but I think we find a reasonable balance, but there could be uh, for example, yeah, improvement in order to simplify implementation as far as we see it. Um, so, so these could be, could be challenges, but otherwise we, uh, we gained a very uh, strong interest from a lot of companies, also advertising companies, the um, advertising um, Organization in Sweden, for example, bringing together all the advertising companies is also will also support it basically as just one example. Legal firms as well. So we think it's a strong opportunity, and particularly um, since the professional industry has such a big influence on the direction of the planet because it has such an influence. Everything from advertising to which customers you support. So just to put the light on that and the laser focus in all companies, including the big five and so on, applying these type of tools, I think we'll hopefully could drive development in the right direction. Hopefully, hopefully we can contribute to that. Yeah, so this the matrix, you can find it now, as you once said, you can find it on the web. And there also we're specifying kind of who this would be relevant for, what kind of um, professional services industries, and also a little bit how it can be used within the certain industries. I, I think that's specified in the, in the, the yeah, paper, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, so it's, um, sometimes it's not obvious to understand uh, the influence that these type, the, this type of industry can have for the different sectors that they are affecting. Um, so that is um, extremely, um, just rewarding to, to see what you, you can do. Um, so how do you see um, that this tool will, uh, or how, what, what is your next step if we talk about A3 with this tool? But now we have made this as a, a pilot, you could say, right? Now we need to think a little bit, but the, the hope is that we can make this into something that we do on a recurring basis. Uh, then we need to understand that it is uh, sufficiently automated with sufficient high degree of quality without you know, creating tons and tons of work for, uh, for us. So that is you know, step, step one. Uh, if we think that that is achievable, I think that then the next step is also to have the discussion on, on management level, what does this mean for us? Do we want to publish this as part of our annual report? Do we want to have it as an internal tool? Um, and how do we want it to develop over time? And that we can come up with some, uh, uh, th there needs to be a management steering around this. If we put, put this in place, we also need to be able to say, what are we going to do with it? And how are we going to achieve that? And that, I think, would be the next uh, steps now, given that we think we can automate it. But I, I have high hopes that we can uh, make something good, uh, but we need to confirm it. Were there any surprises when you did this? When you got the result, like we didn't think it would be like this, or was it more or less that you hoped for or, or thought? <laughs> I, 
you need to answer also, Sarah. But I, I, I think that uh, overall we're quite happy with the with the result, and we think that okay, this this was uh, was nice. But it also it also kind of represents uh, how should I say the feeling that I think we have in the company. Mm. You know, we work, we like to work with with this uh, type of projects and this type of clients to a large extent. And we our feeling was that that was what we were doing. But it was nice to to put that on uh, on uh, paper. I think that the you know the the, the Maybe surprise was that why didn't anyone do this before? You know, it's, it's not that complicated. But. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I, I totally agree. And I think given that we've had this focus for such a long while, it's not a big surprise, but definitely it's a new way of seeing it, seeing the distribution, and especially adding the client uh, performance together with the project perform or the portfolio. I think that is the you know key new way of seeing and understanding our portfolio. And I think I mean, we have looked at other framework for describing uh, describing these services. So we looked at some uh, Finnish uh, framework, for example. But it became, uh, and it was calculating more the amount of CO2 that we actually were avoiding or saving or, or however it was formulated. But it, be, it was pretty complicated and it was needed to be done then project by project on a very detailed level. And of course, we, we miss that with this framework, that this, if, if it is in a green box, it doesn't say how, how, how much impact it has. It just says that it is in this area. It doesn't say that it was, you know, so we can have two, two different projects that are both in the green box, but one could be 10 times more powerful, but they would say still be in the same box. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we don't have that, and that's what the, the Finns try to achieve. But I, I think this feels usable and, and a very pragmatic and useful tool for us. I'd love to pick up on your question about the, the next steps uh, mm -hmm. also for us. I think what's interesting for us is like, because the disclosure part of this has been such an sort of ongoing uh, challenge that we've been really wanting to bring to the whole industry, uh, for us that's, that's a no-brainer. Like Making this public for our results I think is, is really something that we want to be doing. I think beyond that, what's interesting is how, I guess a little bit like you, how we work it more into our, our processes, our conversations internally, our, our conversations with clients also. Um, specifically, I think, you know, between now and 2030 where the pendulum has really moved away from just what are your commitments to how exactly you're going to get there. So I think the, the project part of this, of like how hard is this working, I think will be a really more and more important conversation. The last piece for us is because we know change takes as many levers as possible, is to think about the push and the pull around this. So we can keep encouraging professional services to do that, and the best ones will, and the less motivated ones won't because it's not in their interest so much. So really thinking about what are the other market forces that can help accelerate this and any kind of, of tool and transparency around this. So is there a client that can be requiring this of their providers? Uh, what, are, you know, what are all the other levers there? Because I think the more different tax at this you have, the more uh, likely your success is. Sorry if I can just pick up on that, because I, I really like this. We, we, of course, would like this to be a publicly communicable mm -hmm. tool. Uh, I think that the, the only challenge I see with that is that we're also very concerned about the, the sort of greenwashing aspects of this, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to, if we put it out, we need to, well, it needs to, to, to hold for scrutiny. Mm -hmm. okay? Exactly. But at the same time, we cannot make it into a, uh, you know, millions of hours of, of work to make sure that it is correct. So we need to be able to trust that it is sufficiently correct so that we can stand by it and that the world can trust us. Mm. And how to do that in a good way, I'm, I'm not sure yet. We will see. Mm. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're running out of time now, but you won. I don't know if you want to say from ERI perspective, next step for PSM before we wrap up. So just quickly. Yes, we're bringing in uh, all the feedback. So we're taking the first step, the 1.0. And um, so far, the feedback has been very positive. So I think we achieved the first steps. That means that. Um, we will look into uh, how we can work together with our partners to, to, to scale this further and get additional companies to adopt it, but also sort of build an action track around this so that we can continue to develop it, which is essential. It's not possible just to put something out and 
it will fly on its own, so we will also need to have a development plan for it, mm. as far as we see it. So that is what we will do. Sounds great. And thank you so much for great presentations and perspectives. And uh, uh, I want to also thank Jane from Race to Zero. We have Henrik and Sara from AFRI, Andrew from Fatara, and Johan from Exponential Roadmap Initiative. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.